This is not the best guy on a championship team, blah, blah, blah. And then it all just flipped immediately. Till the end of time, when I think about this series, that overwhelms literally anything else that happened in the series. Absolutely. I mean, and it's the way in which he did it, man. Like he was using the mid range and we talked about it earlier in the series, how he had kind of abandoned that. He brought back the mid range, especially in that first half and the second half, he's pulling up from three, getting to the basket, beating every single defender. The Sixers put on him. Doc Rivers was trying different schemes. At one point they had Joel Embiid switching onto the perimeter after, you know, their standard coverages weren't, weren't working. So they say, Hey, we like screw it. (laughs) We gotta, we gotta switch here and try something else. And Tatum just burning him getting to the basket. It was, it was a remarkable performance, man. I, I was I was blown away from Tatum. He's had some moments, you know, like in the finals last year, he wasn't up to the standard that we've seen him at in some of these big moments. Um, but the fact he set the bar so high in his NBA career and had so much success early on and continued to progress, right, you got you got to feel good about where he is right now, just in his mid twenties and and where he'll be, and the fact the Celtics can get this out of him in these must win games, even the prior game, Chris, like he sucked, he sucked, and then he ended the game hitting big shot after big shot. The resilience that that took to have that type of wherewithal in that moment after you struggled all game, that felt like it just carried over through all four quarters in the closeout game for Boston. I, I'm blown away by Jason Tatum. Could anything have changed more than the? possible perceptions of this one individual, right? Because he was on his way after, which was a pretty, it was a dud of a finals last year. Okay. And so he has a dud of a finals. And now you're getting to this point, you're down three, two, and you're trying to keep your season alive. And he's just dying out there. He's one for 14 or whatever it was to start that game. And it's like, Okay, you can hear it. It's like, look, Jason Tatum's fantastic player. This is not the kind of guy that you can build it all out around. This is not the best guy on a championship team, blah, blah, blah. And then it all just flips immediately to where not only does he deliver them the win in game six, he then turns around and has one of the great, in fact, I believe the highest point total in a game seven of all time in NBA history. And we were 51. We were a quarter away from him not being that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. 12 we quarter, minutes. We were. Yeah. 12 <laughs> minutes away from Jason Tatum. Well, is he actually just a number two? And there are yes. certain moments he does look more like a number two. In the finals, he he did look more like a number two, but he's still just so young. And I mean, I'm pulling up his age right now as I talk here. He's still only 25. He just Mm -hmm. turned 25 on March 3rd. That's what I was trying to get the date. March 3rd, he turned 25. This was really his age 24 season. And yet yet he's in the conference finals and NBA finals. And look, dude, as great as he is today, uh, we're seeing him make this type of progress before our eyes. right? We know Jason Tatum. He was an all-NBA guy. He was an all-star before that. Now he's a top five MVP candidate. These are the types of moments where that progress, you know, increases further. So if he carries this over now against this, you know, really tough Miami Heat defense uh, with multiple guys, they're going to throw at him. Eric Spolster is going to change defensive schemes. He's got Bam out of bio. They have different types of bodies they can put on Tatum. You know, Boston has lost to Miami once with a with a worse version of Tatum, a younger version during the bubble. They beat him last year in seven games with a better version of Tatum than 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 they had then in the bubble, and we'll see now with what Spo pulls out. I think the that Miami personnel, man, you know, you lose Tyler Hero, and on the surface it feels like that you know is a big blow to your team, but the way Martin and Gabe Vincent and these guys have stepped up on both ends of the floor, how Duncan Robinson has been revived and he's now a dribble handoff off screening threat like he was previously, like in the bubble after fading away for a, a while. 
Matt Struess, those guys have all stepped up in different types of ways with the absence of Hero and all the minutes that have became available, 25, 30-plus minutes per game. So the, I think those types of defensive players could be of great benefit against Boston, whereas, well, not, not Duncan Robinson as a defensive player, but the others, yes, against Tatum in this series, whereas Hero was more of that target for an offense. So in a way, Miami is better equipped without hero against the Celtics with Brown and Tatum being as good as they are than they would have been with them. Well, they really didn't have him last year. And that was, that series went down to a shot, right? I mean, he was, he was all banged up a year ago. Uh, hero. We obviously had him in the bubble and it was great in the bubble. Um, before we move on to th- th- that series, that Boston, uh, Philly game and what else came of it. So with Boston, did Missoula win you over? No, I mean, look, dude, he outcoached Doc Rivers. And I, I think that adjustment he made putting Robert Williams on PJ Tucker was incredibly bright. It was smart. It changed the series. That's why they won it. Philly had no answers for that except to occasionally toss the ball to Tucker or whoever was standing in the corner and, you know, pray that guy hits it. But it completely contained. James Harden, it turned Harden into a scaredy cat on drives to the basket. He was unwilling to attack. He didn't trust himself in his new state with his lack of explosiveness. He knows he can't grift in the same way he did before. I'm not giving Missoula credit for James Harden. Yeah, but he did, he did kind of take that away from him. You know, he, he, at least he made it harder on James Harden to do that. And Joel Embiid, I mean, he just became totally invisible. End of, end of game six, he didn't touch the ball after three minutes and 59 seconds on the clock. Um, just that's partially on him for not demanding the ball. It's partially on Harden for running such a sluggish offense. It's on Doc for a system designed with so little movement, not forcing the ball to Embiid and instructing his players to get the ball to Embiid in those moments. But then in game seven, man, I, uh, look, I have a hard time. You could say Doc Rivers should have come with a better plan knowing that Boston would play the way that they did. And then the first half, P.J. Tucker hitting threes from the corner kept the Sixers' offense in it. He just did, right? So they came with a game plan of, we're going to take these open shots. But they, it felt like once those shots stopped falling, they didn't have a counterpunch. And I, but I can't, I can't entirely blame Doc Rivers for the failure to respond to that tactic change by Joe Mazzulla. To me, Joel Embiid... His performance was absolutely inexcusable. He came out in that first quarter sleepwalking throughout the entire game, a lack of intensity. I don't know how much of it was he hurting. Was that knee starting to really be a pain for him after seeing, but it seemed like last week he was healthy. Seems like things were good. And James Harden, I mean, like we already talked about it. He just was a scaredy cat driving in the basket. He was not an effective player. But more I was than mad at else, him for more getting More than anything, the- and B- Embiid's got to be better, Chris. 